This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. Today in studio, we have Dr. Steve Price. Dr. Price is an associate professor of stream and riparian ecology in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. It's a pleasure to have you in studio today. Uh, Before we get started talking about your research with reptiles and amphibians, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do here at UK. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, So uh, my background, I guess, uh, I, I started my career in in uh, in this field um, several years ago when I was in Wisconsin. That's where I'm orig- originally from. And that took me to North Carolina. Um, and then um, eventually, after going through graduate school and spending a lot of time researching in North Carolina, I ended up um, here in Kentucky. So at the University of Kentucky, I'm, um, I'm a teacher. I'm also a researcher, and I also direct our graduate program. And so I teach various classes um, having to do mostly with stream, and uh, freshwater systems, and um, and reptiles and amphibians especially. So, what first got you interested in reptiles and amphibians? Well, like most herpetologists I know, um, my interest began when I was a child, mm-hmm. and um, I would spend a lot of time, especially with my grandparents, uh, visiting forests and wetlands, um, and other and other uh, places to look for reptiles and amphibians. So. You know, as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in these animals, mm-hmm. and um, and then that passion eventually kind of carried through to when I began uh, when I went to college and began studying. Okay, mm, that's good. Yeah. Well, thank you for providing some information on that. And so now we're going to talk a little bit more about the reptiles and amphibians. And tell us, you know, just kind of before we get started, what is a reptile and what's an amphibian, and then what's the difference between the two? Okay. So first, both reptiles and amphibians are what we would call um, ectotherms, or kind of cold-blooded animals, Mm -hmm. even though their blood is not really cold. (laughs) Um, Basically, it means their body temperatures are are derived from environmental temperatures, right? So they're not maybe the same as the air temperature. An animal like a lizard could go out and sit out in the sun and warm its body temperature. Mm -hmm. To reach body temperatures actually warmer than some of our mammals or birds, which are called endotherms and their body temperatures are basically generated through their metabolic processes, right, through their physiology. So um, a reptile and amphibian, their body temperatures can change with the environment in which they're in. So um, reptiles and amphibians are generally studied together, right, and that's the field of herpetology, but they're actually really different animals. Um, Amphibians have smooth, scaleless skin okay, that is usually moist. So if you see a frog or a salamander, you'll notice kind of a glistening on that skin. So their skin has to stay moist. Um, they don't have claws on their limbs if they're, if they're one that has limbs. And um, they're really prone to kind of drying out. So they need to be found in like moist environments. And of course, amphibians, um, a lot of them lay eggs in water. Their eggs don't have any shell on them. It's just kind of a clear gelatinous envelope. Hmm. And then there's some other amphibians that lay eggs on land, but they have to lay their eggs in kind of really moist spots, like under logs or under rocks, places where the eggs won't dry out. Reptiles, on the other hand, have, are covered in scales, right? And mm-hmm. some reptiles, like our fence lizards, for instance, you can see they have these like big spiky scales on them. Other reptiles may have smaller scales, but these scales protect them from drying out, right? So reptiles can be found in drier and hotter environments than amphibians, generally speaking. Um, if a reptile has uh, has fingers, you know, they'll have claws on it, and of mm-hmm. course not all of them have that. Some snakes don't. And, um, what, and some reptiles lay eggs, and their eggs have shells. Um, other reptiles that actually give birth to live young, um, so they'll carry their babies around with them, and then and then the babies will 
will be birthed and look like little, uh, re resemble the adults. What are some so. examples of those? That well, actually, like all of our venomous snakes in Kentucky oh, okay. give birth to live young. Oh. So all the pit vipers, right? And, um, and then a lot of our water snakes, and it's kind of a big, broad group, but things like our northern water snakes, which are um, decent-sized snakes. Maybe they can get up to about three feet long, kind of thick-bodied. They have a red and green pattern to them. A lot of people see them around streams and rivers throughout Kentucky. And in fact, a lot of people confuse them with cottonmouths, which are, a lot, are venomous and a lot uh, more uncommon than water snakes. But all those water snakes give birth to live young. Eastern garter snakes, which people often see in suburban areas in their backyards, um, they give birth to live young as well. Okay. So can you explain why reptiles and amphibians are important components of both the forest ecosystem and aquatic environments? Yeah, I can do that. So, of course, people don't always see reptiles and amphibians, right? You walk right. through the forest, you walk along a stream, um, there may be a lot of them around you but you can't see them because they like to remain hidden, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you spend a lot of time in the field like I do or like my students do, you start realizing how incredibly abundant these animals can be. Take salamanders, for instance, in our forests in eastern Kentucky. Um, there's been some studies that have looked at, at salamanders in these, these forested sites, and the collective biomass, meaning if you were to weigh every single one of these little salamanders, can outweigh that of all the other vertebrates, meaning birds and mammals together. So there's wow. just a, a lot of these animals um, in ecosystems in Kentucky. And because there's so many, they serve actually as a very important prey source for a lot of other animals. Okay, Things mm -hmm. like eating frogs, some things like eating salamanders, of course mm -hmm. things like eating snakes, so you have like wading birds, let's say next to wetlands like herons and egrets, they eat a lot of amphibians and reptiles, a lot of mammals eat reptiles, so they're a very important component um, to the ecosystem that way. And mm -hmm. because there's so many, they, are all, they serve as predators as well, right? Mm -hmm. All, um, or most amphibians and reptiles um, eat other animals, okay? So salamander larvae, for instance, in a, in a pond. And these are basically the tadpoles of salamanders, okay? Mm -hmm. the, before they had, uh, metamorphose and, go th and become adults, they eat a lot of aquatic um, invertebrates like mosquito larvae and things like that. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, and um, snakes, for instance, a lot of them eat, eat rodents, right? So they play a very important role in, um, in rodent control. A really cool example of this are timber rattlesnakes, which, um, you know, people have various feelings about. But there's been one study that looked at timber rattlesnakes and, and their consumption of mice. And in fact, in some areas, they consume mice that are uh, that carry ticks on them, the same ticks that uh, that uh, give give people Lyme's disease. And it was estimated that an individual timber rattlesnake each year consumed somewhere around four to five thousand ticks, right? So they're removing these disease vectors right uh -huh. up from the environment. So I think in, the, in that way, they're, they're, they can be in, important components, not only to ecosystems, but also, you know, for, for people mm -hmm. as well. So, so where are they hiding? You mentioned that they were all around <laughs> us and we don't see them. Right. So where are they? Yeah, you, you have to look, you know, <laughs> under logs, uh -huh. under rocks. Sometimes snakes will bask in trees or in shrubs, um, but they're just very, very good at blending in. They mm -hmm. have camouflage in a lot of cases, so it's hard to see. They can bury themselves in, in leaf litter. And so you have to have a, a keen eye and, and, and search out these areas, but then you'll start finding them once you develop kind of a search image and what you're looking for. Okay, oh, that's good. So if you're walking along the trail, they won't bother you. I mean, as long as you don't step on one or anything. Yeah, I mean, stay out of the way. most of them, um, in fact, I will, I will say all of them, yeah. <laughs> do not want to interact with people, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to avoid you, okay. right? And uh, so if they see you coming and they don't feel like they are hidden enough, they're going to get out of there, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes, you know, you walking along a path and, you know, you'll hear a snake or a lizard or something scurry into the, the forest near, nearby because mm -hmm. they see us as predators mm -hmm. that could potentially cause them harm or eat them, okay? Mm -hmm. um, in a few cases, sometimes,
some people say, well, I was walking down this path and this snake started chasing me. Okay, I hear this from people quite a bit. But usually what's happening there is that snake has a particular refuge, like a hole or a log or something <laughs> it wants to get to, and you're between that snake <laughs> and where it wants to go. So that okay. snake might ha- head in your direction a little right. bit, thinking, I need to get get down here and... and uh, and but it, they're they're not chasing you. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Right. It does. Right, yeah. So what are what are some interesting behaviors of reptiles and amphibians? Yeah, I mean, it, it, so in Kentucky we have fifty six different reptile species um, and fifty five different amphibians. So mm-hmm. it's a high amount of diversity, right? And with that diversity comes all kinds of really cool and interesting things. At least in my perspective, mm-hmm. that, that reptiles and amphibians do. So one behavior that um, is really interesting that maybe um, some of the listeners may have, have, have seen has to do with a snake called the Eastern Hog Nose Snake. Okay, so this is a, a harmless snake um, that maybe gets about two, two feet long, a little bit thick bodied. It's called hog nose because it has the, the scale on the tip of its nose is turned up. So it kind of looks like a little snout of a pig or something oh, okay. like that. Okay. But when you find one of these guys in a Kentucky forest, they have a wide variety of defensive behaviors to to get you to leave it alone, okay? The first thing that these snakes do is they hood up like a cobra, okay? And kind of stand a hood up and then make a hissing sound, right? Uh And if that doesn't scare the, the, the potential predator or, or, or person, um, the snake will begin to strike, but it will do so with its mouth closed. So it won't have its mouth open. So it's just kind of pretending to bite. Okay. If you continue to harass these snakes, um, they'll throw up whatever meal they last ate. Okay. They'll go to the bathroom all over themselves, (laughs) you know, (laughs) defecate and kind of, kind of smear it all over their body make themselves just kind of utterly disgusting. <laughs> and then if you continue to harass it, they'll roll over on their back, open their mouth, stick their tongue out, and play dead. Oh, my. <laughs> and if you back off a little bit, you can see the snake kind of raise its head up a little bit, check out where, where you are. If you come close again, the head goes back, back down, the mouth <laughs> open, the tongue is out. So it's a really neat and interesting defensive behavior um, that, that this snake does. Um, amphibians have equally fascinating behaviors, you know, a, l- a lot of it has to do with, with, uh, with these animals making it through kind of maybe harsh, hot, dry conditions. One example of this is a, a totally aquatic salamander called a siren, okay? And these salamanders breathe in the water, they have external gills, so they can't come on to land and, and breathe, and, uh, but they live in wetlands, especially in, in western Kentucky. Um, is where they're found. And a lot of times these wetlands during the summer months dry up. You know, if we have a really hot summer with not a lot of rain, these wetlands will dry up. Mm-hmm. But these guys can, need to stay in these wetlands, so they kind of make, make a, a burrow um, in the mud and then create a cocoon through skin secretions, through their mucous skin secretions, and create this cocoon, and they can estivate in that cocoon up to a year, stay oh uh, in this mud cocoon up to a year. And um, then when the wetland fills back up with water, what they do is they actually eat that that, that cocoon, <laughs> and then they go back and swim around looking for, for things to eat and going about their, their uh, daily business. So that's the, those are some examples of some interesting behaviors that reptiles and amphibians have. Okay, so can you expand a little bit on the um, diversity of amphibians and reptiles? Yeah, sure. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, we have 56 reptiles in Kentucky. Nine of those are lizards, and of the nine lizards, two are actually introduced. They're not native to Kentucky. Um, We have 33 different snake species and then 14 turtle species in Kentucky. And amphibians, we have 55 different amphibian species. 20 of those are frogs, and 35 are salamanders. So we have a pretty high diversity of reptiles and amphibians in Kentucky. Um, There's several reasons for this, but one has to do with kind of the different types of environments we have within Kentucky. So in the eastern part of the state, um, we have more kind of a rugged landscape, more mountains. We have a lot of streams mm-hmm. and and uh, a lot of forests. And this is where we find our high, some of our highest salamander diversity. And then if you move into kind of the knobs and the bluegrass region, you know, although a lot of this, this landscape is kind of altered, you know, for 
there's a lot of cities here and right. horse farms and other things like that. We still have some unique species that are only found there. And some species reach their highest abundances in the bluegrass. Things like queen snakes, which are water snakes, um, reach high abundances in the bluegrass. We have uh, some unique salamanders, including the streamside salamander that's found in abundance in the bluegrass. And then as you move into the western part of the state, especially as you get into the Jackson Purchase region, that, that far western part of Kentucky, it's almost like a, t it's a totally different environment, right? Mm -hmm. You have this lowland, lots of wetlands. We see things like cypress and tupelo swamps. And in that, we see a lot of reptiles and amphibians that are more uh, common, I would guess, in the uh, U.S. southeast coastal plain, mm -hmm. okay? And so this is where we get things like cottonmouths. We see um, some pretty high water snake diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we get some amphibians that are, are only found in these, in these environments. So because of the varied um, environments in Kentucky, that results in some of the real high, high diversity that we see within this group. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. For those of you who may be just joining us each week towards the beginning of the show, we will play a wildlife sound from the forest. So here's our sound for today. Stay tuned. Towards the end of the show, we will tell you what this animal is and why it makes this sound. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. We've been talking with Dr. Steve Price, Associate Professor of Stream and Riparian Ecology in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. Let's get back to the show. So is there an average lifespan for both? or? Yeah, it varies a lot given you know all the diversity. We have some frogs that may just live a year or two, you know, just reproduce once in their life. An example of that would be a eastern cricket frog, which is a um, a small uh, a frog that's found around wetlands. Um, and uh, they, they live for a very short amount of time, we think. But some other ones live for a very long time. Turtles are notorious uh, for, for having longevity. You know, most turtles take several years to reach sexual maturity. That is, they don't reproduce until they're eight, nine, or ten years old, mm -hmm. okay? And then they reproduce every year after that, but they may live up to 40 or 50 or 60 years. An interesting story... Um, has to do with our eastern box turtles, which are terrestrial turtles that are found throughout Kentucky. They prefer forested areas, they kind of have high domed shells, the males are usually quite colorful, red eyes, uh, orange scales. M most people in Kentucky have come across box turtles, mm -hmm. but I had one uh, person send me a picture of a box turtle that he found on his great-grandparents' farm. Okay, mm -hmm. and this box turtle had his great grandfather's initials carved <laughs> in the in the shell, and um, we estimated that the age of this turtle was was about 105 years old, um, which uh, of course that guy could have been playing a trick on me, right? right. But who calls a herpetologist right. just to play a trick on him? But um, but we think that this box turtle, you know, was that old, and it, it's it's we know from other places that these box turtles can live easily into their mm -hmm. 70s or 80s and, and, and maybe older. So um, some of them are capable of very long lifespans. So speaking of turtles, I know I've heard people that say, well, I found this turtle and then they're keeping it. Is yeah. that something they shouldn't do or, you know, yeah. they found it out in the, the wild somewhere? And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to keep our native reptiles and amphibians in Where the you wild. found them. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, from, from an idea, you know, as somebody who has pets, right, mm -hmm. the, thing, the, the thing with turtles is they live for a long time, right? right? So you find this cute little baby turtle and you bring it home, you put it in your aquarium. Well, you better be a dedicated pet owner for the next 40 or 50 years <laughs> because that animal can live potentially a very long time uh -huh. in, in captivity, right? So probably best to keep these animals uh, out, out in the wild. So, you know, as you are walking in the forest or, you know, along a stream, 
and do you just leave them alone or can you touch them at all? I mean, I know you were mentioning don't bring them home, but what should you do, you know, just while you're out there? Yeah. So in Kentucky, we have four species of, of venomous snakes. <laughs> okay. Timber rattlesnakes, copperheads. Those are the two most common, with the copperheads being more common than the timber rattlesnakes. Then we have cottonmouths in western Kentucky. And in the land between the lakes, we have a very small rattlesnake called a pygmy rattlesnake. Okay, so there's four species of venomous snakes. All the rest, the 29 other species of snakes we have in Kentucky are harmless. Okay, um, that doesn't mean if you you could pick them up and they might bite or you know a musk on you or do something you know that, well, you're still that would not make them, them pleasant, they, right? They don't like that, I'm sure. But um, I always recommend people when it comes to snakes. You know, if you don't know your snake ID, it's best to observe these animals, and you can get even get you know fairly close. Don't put your your face down in next to <laughs> yeah. them, but you can get, you know, a, a few feet away, mm-hmm. observe them, take some pictures, and then just, just let them be. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, our, of our other reptiles or amphibians, let's say turtles, um, some of them, you know, can probably be safely handled, but they will defend themselves occasionally, especially mm-hmm. things like snapping turtles that we have. You know, those are yeah, not maybe. a very pleasant animal to handle. <laughs> they will uh, lunge and snap, especially when you find them on land, <laughs> right? Um, but even some of our amphibians, you know, they're cool to observe. Um, you know, it's fun catching frogs and things like that, but you have to be aware that amphibians um, in their s- specialized, you know, smooth skin, um, they have two main types of, of, of glands, okay? One produces mucus and another produces poison, okay? All amphibians have this. Mm-hmm. And um, the poison, you know, may just make them distasteful, right? Or it may be like an irritant to your eyes or other mucous membranes, mm-hmm. right? So you have to mm-hmm. be careful, wash your hands after you handle them, um, and, uh, and then you should be be pretty safe you know keep in mind if you're going to pick up any amphibian though you know their their skin is very sensitive so if you have lotions or bug sprays or stuff on your hands Mm -hmm. it could potentially kill them so Mm -hmm. yeah and do some of them change colors as well or do they do they not do that oh yeah um so a a lot of reptiles and amphibians are capable of color change Mm -hmm. um like dramatic uh, color change sure like our gray tree frogs okay we have two species of gray tree frog one's called a copes gray tree frog and the other is just the gray tree frog okay Okay. but they're not always gray in color right when they're vocalizing when the males are calling from wetlands at night they're oftentimes bright green and then during the day they're a gray color and then sometimes they can even be even darker almost almost a black so they're capable of that color change. A lot of that has to do with temperature or other behaviors. Um, some of our reptiles change colors. Um, uh, eastern fence lizards, for example, can, can change colors from being almost a very uh, very slate type gray color to a much, much darker brown. So um, a lot of reptiles and amphibians, yes, are, are capable of changing color. Great. Um, so you actually developed the content for the Snake ID website that we have. So can you tell our listeners um, about this website and how it might be useful to them? Yeah, so this website introduces um, folks from Kentucky and elsewhere in the southeast to uh, the, the 33 snakes native to, to Kentucky. Okay, mm-hmm. and uh, within this website, you know, we have um, species accounts, so it covers each species. It talks a little bit about where you find them in Kentucky, uh, what types of interesting behaviors they may have, some aspects of their ecology. Um, so it's a good resource in that way, and there's a ton of pictures of, of most of these animals. You know, we spent a lot of time going out and trying to find uh, good, good pictures for, for these snakes. But another really cool feature of this website is it can allow somebody who sees a snake let's say in their backyard or when they're out on a hike it can help them identify these snakes Mm -hmm. by keying in on or by using specific features of that animal okay Um, some of these include things like morphological features like what was the head shape like what was the body shape like is it stocky is it thin for example right Mm -hmm. Um, even some aspects are like what did the the eye look like which you know that probably you should probably shouldn't get that close (laughs) to the snake if you don't know what it is to look at its eye but you know if you have a good uh, close-up picture you could use that Um, it also looks at things like the region in Kentucky where you uh, 
where you saw this snake. So you mm -hmm. can use that. You could put all this, this information together, and then the website will spit out a list of snakes that this could potentially be. So you, it can help you identify um, these snakes. So that's a really cool feature of the website that I think um, many people have found useful mm -hmm. so far. And um, yeah, in, in general, we're just we're real excited about this project. I think it's been fairly successful. So. Great. So tell us about um, the other research. I know you've got the, the snake project. Um, what is some of the other research that you're doing here? Yeah, so the research in my lab generally focuses on the conservation bio and biology and management of reptiles and amphibians. And um, in order to effectively manage and conserve these species, we have to know actually a lot of information about their populations. And amazingly, for a lot of reptiles and amphibians, we don't know even their distribution fully within the state, but we don't for sure know how long they live, you know, what their movements are like, you know, how many young are produced each year in populations. So we spend a lot of time trying to learn this, this information about these populations. Um, so examples, we have studies going on in eastern Kentucky looking at, at stream salamanders, both in um, University of Kentucky's Robinson Forest and elsewhere, trying to understand how they respond to different environmental disturbances and changes to land use. Um, we also have a lot of projects that kind of focus on imperiled species in Kentucky. Um, one example of this is a, a frog species called the crawfish frog that's found in, in western Kentucky. And uh, these frogs um, are really neat animals. Um, they spend almost their whole life in burrows dug by crayfish or crawfish, depending on how you want to call it. <laughs> um, but then during the um, late winter, they move to wetlands to breed. And the males have this deep snoring call um, that, that travels quite a distance. So you can hear them pretty easily. And they'll stay in these wetlands just for a couple days each year. The females will come in there, they'll lay eggs, and then the tadpoles will develop in the wetlands. Um, and then uh, the adults will move back out into the uh, land around the, the wetland to spend their time in, in these, these crayfish burrows or other mm -hmm. holes that they find. Um, this species is imperiled um, mostly because of kind of some, some changes to the, the land or the, the type of habitat that they prefer. Mm -hmm. they, in western mm -hmm. Kentucky, we used to have a lot of prairie type habitat, and these crawfish frogs like that grassland habitat. We don't see as much of that anymore. It's mm -hmm. highly fragmented. So we spend a lot of time researching these animals in western Kentucky. Um, in central Kentucky, we have some projects on um, the streamside salamander, which is... Um, uh, close to what we would consider kind of a regionally endemic species. And endemic means this it's the only place in the world where this animal is found. Oh. And so about over 50% of its global distribution is in Kentucky, and it probably reaches its highest abundances in the bluegrass region of Kentucky. Huh. So we've spent a lot of time surveying for this animal. The really good news is this animal is almost everywhere. <laughs> so it does really well, and, um, and we've been able to, to document that, that we find it in a lot of different places. So that, that's really neat. Is there a reason why it's only in this area? Well, um, that, that, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it's, it's related to, closely related to a couple of other salamander species uh, um, that are also found in Kentucky. And this animal seems to prefer areas that have kind of limestone parent material in terms mm -hmm. of the geology. Mm -hmm. And they have a really unique uh, ecology where they are the only salamander from this group um, that they're part of called the mole salamanders that breed in streams. Mm -hmm. And so they'll move to the streams, you know, actually starting um, late November, early December, and then they'll stay in these streams for several months. Females will lay eggs in the streams, kind of adhere them to the undersides of large rocks. And then the, um, the, the salamander larvae hatch out of the eggs and then spend the time in these streams until the streams go dry in June or July. Okay. And so they, they use kind of a, a unique specialized habitat that, that mm -hmm. is very common actually in the bluegrass region of okay. Kentucky. So, so in addition to some of the research that you're doing, um, I know you also have a teaching component in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. So for those students that might be listening, can you tell us about some of the undergraduate or graduate courses that you teach? Right. So. At UK, I teach a herpetology course, so I offer this course um, every spring. 
of course, we cover just kind of a lot of the basic biology of these animals, but we also, uh, one of the things that some students like, not all of them, but we also, we, we learn how to identify each species. We learn its common and scientific name. Any student leaving herpetology should should feel pretty confident in knowing the, you know, over 100 species of reptiles and amphibians we have in the state. And then um, late in the semester, we spend a lot of time in the field, so we visit, you know, the Red River Gorge and places in the bluegrass and in the knobs region looking for reptiles and amphibians. So it's a lot of fun. Um, in addition to herpetology, um, I've taught a freshwater ecology course in the past. Um, and this course uh, talks about all aspects of freshwater systems. So we cover lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands, talk about the interesting organisms that live in them, and focus on a lot of the, the ecosystem processes that go on in freshwater systems. I've taught an urban ecology class before. So um, previously, a lot of my research that focused um, on the responses of reptiles and amphibians to urbanization. Um, so we talk about all aspects of urban ecology both the good and the bad. <laughs> and then uh, I teach a graduate level class, a research methods class for our graduate students. I've taught many seminars, seminar type courses as well. And, um, and then I also teach a summer course through the Natural Resources and Environmental Science program in Costa Rica. Yeah. So focusing on natural resource issues in Costa Rica. So I spend uh, a couple weeks each summer in Costa Rica with, with students. That's got to be really interesting, going to Costa Rica. Oh, it's yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's such a biodiverse country. It's great for somebody like me interested in reptiles and amphibians and other animals because we get to see a lot of, of neat things, obviously, that are found in, in North America. And we, uh, we travel throughout the country, see a lot of different interesting ecosystems, everywhere from lowland tropical rainforests to, to dry forests in the western part, and we get to some high elevation places as well. So. So another thing um, that we have here in the department is a new wildlife biology and management minor. Can you talk about, and I know you're part of that minor, can you talk about why that minor is important and who might benefit by taking that minor? I guess it's important, for one, we haven't had this minor before, <laughs> but we've had a ton of interest in, in wildlife, right? So mm -hmm. now we have this formal mi minor and we have uh, the ability for students to take, kind of, to focus on wildlife-related issues, mm -hmm. okay? So students that, that would have interest in this, I think obviously a lot of the, the forestry students, um, because understanding wildlife in our forests is an important component of forestry, mm -hmm. right? And then of course, natural resources and environmental science students, biology students, animal science students. We have a broad array of students from different majors minoring in, in our wildlife minor right now. So uh, it's an exciting time. Yeah, yeah that's good, great. Well, you've presented us with a lot of great information today, and we, we really appreciate that. But what would be one or two takeaway points you would like our listeners to, um, to leave with? Well, I would, I would say that probably most important is um, people should go out and experience the forests and wetlands and streams in Kentucky. You know, even if they don't like reptiles and amphibians, there's some, some wonderful places in Kentucky where you can see, see the natural world. I would um, tell listeners, go out and do this, H hike around the state, and, and take advantage of, of some of the great opportunities this state offers. That's good. Well, thank you, Dr. Price, for joining us today. And if you'd like more information on what you heard on this segment of today's show, you can visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Now stay tuned for Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. This week we have a guest with us from the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. It's one of our wildlife faculty, Steve Price, Associate Professor of Stream and Riparian Ecology. And he's going to talk about this sound you heard earlier. Okay, okay, now tell us what was that sound? <laughs> All right, well that quacking sound that you heard was actually made by a frog 
called a wood frog. Okay, mm-hmm. and wood frogs are um, really interesting frogs that are found in in woods. Right, they're mm-hmm. forest dwelling frogs, and they're found uh, pretty much throughout Kentucky in forested areas. And uh, they the males move to wetlands and other bre- and other um, freshwater aquatic sites um, in forested areas during the winter months, oftentimes mm-hmm. in January in Kentucky, usually after we have kind of a, a rainy night. And uh, they will make that quacking call to attract the females to these wetlands. Now, um, wood frogs have a very short calling period in Kentucky. So mm-hmm. we have some frogs that call for a very long time, maybe for several months. Mm-hmm. Wood frogs call for maybe only a few days to several days, and that's mm-hmm. it. So their entire breeding activity occurs over a very short period of time mm-hmm. during our winter months. Um, so the males will attract the females, and, and uh, the females will lay eggs, and he will fertilize them, and then uh, new wood frogs will emerge from, from these wetlands um, if, uh, sometime in, in June. Um, of the of the following spring or mm-hmm. summer. Is there a specific location for wood frogs, or are they just all over Kentucky? Well, they're most common in the eastern part of the state, okay. but we do have some populations in the bluegrass and some populations in the western part of the state as well. But the, of course, they're they're most common where we have most of our forests, and that's the and eastern Kentucky is a good place to find them. Yeah. Okay, so I guess now we're going to do our second sound. So let's hear that. Okay, now what was that sound? Well, that high-pitched whistling uh, was a small frog called the northern spring peeper. Okay, and uh, these frogs, you know, are maybe maybe an inch long, mm-hmm. and um, and but they can make an incredible sound. Sometimes their their uh, their call can be heard on a on a clear night with low wind for over a mile away. Okay, wow. and. Um, the males will, will call at wetlands um, and other aquatic sites um, to attract the females. And they, given their name Spring Peeper, they're kind of like the, the harbinger of spring, right? So uh-huh. they start calling some years as early as February, but you can usually hear them in March and April in Kentucky calling from these, these wetlands. And if you've ever moved into or walked into a wetland that is full of spring peepers, you can hear nothing else except these <laughs> high-pitched frogs yeah. calling. It's a it's pretty incredible experience. So now let's listen to that third sound. And tell us what that sound was. Okay. Well, that was the sound of um, a rattlesnake. Okay. Then that's the timber rattlesnake that's found um, in mostly in mountainous regions in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. So um, everybody knows that rattlesnakes can make that sound. What's interesting, mm-hmm. though, is is oftentimes uh, our timber rattlesnakes actually don't rattle <laughs> when you when you come close really? to them, right? Yeah. I mean, of course, if you were to step very close to one or on one, they might make that rattling noise. But a lot mm-hmm. of times, these rattlesnakes stay pretty quiet when you when you come across them in the forest. If you do hear that noise, it means you're very close to one, <laughs> and you should probably check out your surroundings r- really quickly mm-hmm. and uh, and and back out of there somewhat slowly okay Mm -hmm. but um it's a it's a uh sound these these snakes make to announce their presence to avoid having to defend themselves right and so and in in most cases at least historically it probably worked unfortunately now a lot of people hear this then can locate the rattlesnake and then you know unfortunately uh kill it (laughs) you know which is not a in my opinion a great thing but Well, thank you, Dr. Price, for coming in and doing Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. We greatly appreciate it. All right. Thank you. If you'd like more information on what you've heard today on today's segment or any show for that matter, you can visit our website at fromthewoodsky.org. All right. Thank you for joining us today. Um, You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky. If you have any questions about things that you heard on today's show, please visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned each Thursday from 10 to 11 a.m. for another edition of From the Woods, Kentucky. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. 
We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to wrfl.fm slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.